everybody for tuning in to this uh, webcast. Um, as Daniel said, I'm Jeremy Morgan. I've been a Pluralsight author for about five years. I've done uh, five courses in IT ops. Um, I've been a developer professionally for around 20 years, and I've worked with a variety of companies from startups that couldn't keep their lights on to Fortune 100s, kind of all over the map. And uh, I've spent the last several years as a DevOps engineering consultant, mostly in the Windows space. So. Um, I've enjoyed being brought on stage to celebrate awesome product launches, and I've sat in a data center at 2 a.m. eating pizza, wondering if I'm going to keep my job. So seeing the highs and lows, uh, made mistakes, and learned from them. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So there's no question that the era of cloud computing is here. Um, what was once considered a nice to have or something to shoot for is now pretty much a foundation of any technology organization. Now, the big question is why? Why should organizations spend money, time, and resources to move everything to the cloud? You know, is it so we can chase the latest fads or tell everyone we're on the cutting edge of tech? Uh, no, there are actually very practical reasons for cloud migration. So with the emergence of DevOps and changes to how we deliver software, speed has increased. And customers aren't waiting six months or a year for a batch of features anymore. Um, they expect constant improvement. So if your competition is delivering software features faster, you're at a disadvantage. And cloud technologies are designed around the concept, the concept of continuous delivery. So lower costs are another factor, and they've always been important to any business, right? Any reduction of expenses means more cushion from unexpected events, the ability to increase your investments and grow, and cloud services enable you to only pay for what you need. And long term, they provide cost savings that traditional infrastructures can't really match. And then there's security. So security risks increase by the hour these days. Moving everything into our lives in, onto the internet gives motivation for bad actors to access your data. Cloud services provide security and a peace of mind that is kind of expensive to implement with traditional infrastructure. So and scalability. In today's world, your business could double the amount of customers in a day. It happens all the time. And when that happens, you don't want to be lugging servers into a data center and plugging them in to respond to that. And with the cloud, you're moving a slider or having some automated scripts come in and add capacity for you. So migrating your infrastructure to the cloud is an investment for the organization. Now, an important thing to understand is that organizations aren't changing to adapt to the cloud. The cloud is adapting to change, or the cloud is adapting and changing by the way that we develop software. Most cloud services are designed as a reaction to a changing process. For instance, engineers aren't moving virtualized servers because they're available on the cloud. Many organizations have been using virtualized servers for years because it improves the software development process, it makes your infrastructure more scalable, more reliable, and then cloud providers are now offering virtual servers at a lower cost with automation tools to assist in provisioning. So long story short, it's the organizations, it's you that's driving change in cloud providers to provide the best solutions in reactions to what you need. So today we're going to talk about migrating your organization to the cloud. We're gonna talk about cloud maturity and we'll explore the idea of cloud maturity and what it means for your organization. Um, we'll talk about where you are now, how you can determine where your organization currently is in their cloud migration, and we'll talk about where you want to be. Um, very few organizations are living 100% in the cloud, and many don't need to be. So we'll look at how to assess that. Finally, we'll talk about migrating your infrastructure and what that looks like, some common pain points and how to address them. So let's get started. What is cloud maturity? It's a benchmark that determines where you are in your transformation from on-premises infrastructure to a cloud-based infrastructure. And it's far from a straight line path. It's usually full of pitfalls and lessons. So when we look at cloud maturity, let's start with the spectrum that we're looking at. On one side, we have an infrastructure that we're all familiar with, right? Our servers are hosted in our building, in our data center. We have servers set up and they're named after Greek gods or Disney characters or something. And we have a smart group of engineers that keep them running 24 seven. We have web servers, database servers, file servers, you name it. And they're all right down the hall in that noisy room with the dim lights and the raised floor. Or maybe it's a repurposed office or broom closet in some organizations. So this is 100% on-premises and we refer to this as on-prem. 
And this model served us well for decades. And frankly, it still serves some organizations well. Um, but this is one end of the spectrum. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have everything cloud. We have servers per the old definition. Most of our applications though, they run in services. So we don't have database servers, we have a data service that scales up or down when we need it. Um, and at this end of the spectrum, there isn't a single machine in our building that's providing any kind of service. It's all hosted in the cloud. So our goal in cloud transformation is to get from here to here as quickly as possible, right? Well, spoiler alert, few organizations out there are 100% in the cloud and many don't need to be, but we need to determine where on the spectrum our organization re resides. And as I mentioned, it's not a straight line from prem to cloud. This is our plural site, cl plural site cloud index, which represents where you're at on particular vectors of cloud adoption. Each point on the map represents a step in moving to the cloud. So we're going to break this down into phases so you can determine where you're at now. You can be really far in one direction and ground zero at the other. So we'll come back to this index quite frequently. So here are the phases of cloud maturity when you're going from an on-premise solution to the cloud. The first step is experimentation and foundation. This is where you're just starting to consider a move to the cloud and planning your strategy. Phase two is when you're in the process of starting to move things over. Phase three is repetition and expansion. You've moved things over, you have a system in place and you're operational in the cloud. Now you're just mig migrating small parts of your system over. And phase four is when you've made all the moves you need to make, and now you need to observe and maintain the cloud-based infrastructure. So let's determine where we're at. If you're in phase one, you're living in this part of the matrix. You wanna to move to the cloud and you're making plans to do so. So let's look at some of the vectors here. First, let's talk about executive buy-in. Now this is a critical vector but it's a wild card due to your organization size. So it could be that you're the head of IT and development, so you're the executive, or you may be in a spot where there are many layers of permissions needed. This part of the phase involves getting permission to move to the cloud and getting executive buy-in, as most of you know, isn't always easy. But the move to the cloud can be very expensive. So not only are you incurring new costs from the cloud provider, you're paying engineers to work on the transition, um, you're throwing away all that expensive hardware in the data center when you're done, and decision makers wanna know if this is the right move to make. Most organizations go through a try and see approach here. You need to run experiments and do kind of a proof of concept. If you're at the very beginning of this phase, a good tactic is to take a service or application with minimal dependencies and create a plan to move that to the cloud. Now, the reason I call out dependencies rather than risk or how heavily used it is, is because an application with a lot of dependencies will take a lot of time and resources to move and it's more likely to fail. So you don't want your most problematic application or service to be the one that determines whether or not you make the move to the cloud. So say that application that runs on Windows Vista and churns out a report with some long abandoned software is not the one you wanna choose for your first proof of concept. Um, you'll want to choose something that's a little more portable. So back to our index here, we're going to look at these vectors in order of priority and it's at least the priority that I've seen that I've seen assigned to things kind of out in the wild. And in phase one, let's talk about hardware here. You have all your servers on prem. They're either in a data center on site um, in your building or at a co-location facility um, downtown where people monitor and and maintain them there. Your servers are bare metal servers mounted on racks and you may have database servers, file servers, mail servers, things like that. Um, if they're hosted off site, you have a VPN to access them. If they're on site, it's tied into your internal network. Um, you may have web servers as well that are exposed through the firewall or sitting on a DMZ or something. This is how we've done things for decades. So what does your data situation look like in phase one? All your data is on-prem. It's on file servers and database servers and things that reside on-site on physical machines. So you've got a physical machine with Windows or Linux. It's, it has the database software on there. Um, just very uh, old school, I guess you would say, kind of way of setting it up. Now, ideally when moving to the cloud, you wanna to move towards virtually hosted database servers 
and probably eventually database services. So virtualization is another vector and it's a big determiner of maturity because for decades we had physical servers with names and assignments and then came larger machines that would host small servers with, inside of it with virtualization. So now we have virtualization in the cloud. So that allows you to spec out a server with a web interface and press build. Um, so you need to determine where are you on this vector? Are you still using bare metal servers? Are you doing virtualization there on site in your organization? Or have you moved to virtual servers in the cloud? And the next vector is where are your applications hosted? Are they traditional web-based or client server application or client server architecture apps running on site? Um, at this stage of maturity, it's likely that everything is running um, on that hosted home server within your network. And continuous integration is another vector. So when engineers commit code, what happens? And this can be entirely independent of the cloud. You can be in phase one and 100% on-prem and still have full integration with source code. But it is one of the indicators of maturity. And how about continuous deployment? Are your applications still delivered by manually copying artifacts to production servers? Do you have an FTP server? Is this automated? Um, some organizations are still slow to automatically deploy software. And that's with good reason. If you haven't established a resilient system with easy fallbacks, you do need a human being to be kind of a gatekeeper to keep new software releases from totally breaking the system. And finally, how's your observability and monitoring? Um, are you just gathering logs and looking at them when something breaks or do you have services that monitor uptime and performance? Do you have um, software that's installed or custom software? Um, do you have security scans? This is another vector that can be done 100% on premises, but you'll need third party applications to do that. So rather than reserving relying on the observability of cloud partners, you'll have software that's installed or software that you built to do the same things. And the uh, services that are on the cloud are generally far cheaper than the on-prem solutions. So in the first stage of cloud maturity, you'll likely have no application monitoring happening or very little and be pretty reliant on logs and sharp engineers to keep an eye on things. So this is what phase one looks like. <clears throat> and this is phase two, phase three, and four. And naturally, this is nowhere near how it works in the real world. Um, your mileage will vary. You'll likely end up with something that looks a little more like this, right? And we still like to think of it in phases. So we'll talk about what living in each of those phases is like. Now, one common thing you'll see here in this presentation is experimentation. If I had to narrow down one thing that's required to be successful, it's experimentation in this process. You have to try things and observe them. Um, you have to make future decisions based on those results and do it over and over again. The faster and more often you're doing it, um, the more likely you are to succeed. And this doesn't stop after you've moved to the cloud. This is permanent. This is from here on out. So if you wanna know where you are now, you have to determine, or if you know where you are now, you have to determine where you wanna be. So phase one is basically square one. You have all your servers on premise. Everything lives here. Your deployment is likely manual. Um, you don't have a lot of uh, monitoring or observation going on. So where do you go from here? Well, here are your first steps. First, you need to establish a proof of concept. And this is a small project to kind of sample a bit of cloud. And this is, uh, like I was saying earlier, take a project that doesn't have a ton of dependencies. Maybe it's a, a small little service or it's a small website for your company and you can just pick it up and move it without a lot of problems. That's gonna be your first good uh, proof of concept site. And this serves two purposes. You can prove it to yourself and the team that you're able to make the step to the cloud once successful and you can prove it to management. And the next step is establish an innovation team or you can name it whatever you like. But take a group of engineers and ask them to be the go-to folks to move the thing to the cloud. Now the act of creating a team around it makes it real. So both to the engineers and other people in the organization, if there's a team dedicated to this, then it's a serious effort. And then do a cost-benefit analysis. You know, as much cost-benefit analysis as you can do 
in that moment? You know, did you save costs by moving it to the cloud? Did you accrue more? Um, is it worth money to make the switch? And don't forget to factor in the total cost of ownership. So if you're moving from those uh, big iron servers sitting in a data center, um, using up electricity, remember to factor that in as you're doing your cost benefit analysis. So phase two is the migration and standardization phase. So you've proved that you can move something to the cloud and now you're more looking to the future. And in this phase, you'll likely have a hybrid infrastructure. You'll have some things that are cloud-based, but most things will be still hosted on-prem. Now, a common pattern here is when you have a company with significant internal infrastructure, they'll move the public website to the cloud while having the rest on-prem. So especially if the, the public website isn't a part of a revenue generating part of the company, that's usually the first thing that they can move out. Um, you put it on the cloud, get it hosted, and then maybe figure out some ways to connect it back to the infrastructure. So I've seen that pattern used quite a bit. And your deployment in this phase is still pretty manual. Uh, most of your artifacts are being moved manually from development to staging to production. Um, especially when you're making the jump from on-prem, you know, if you have your uh, staging and test servers on-prem, you've got to move them over manually through a VPN or other, other ways to, to move it onto the cloud. So your buy-in at this point is increased, but management is still kind of watching how things go, and they're not yet fully committed to the cloud. So to move out of this phase, you'll need to do the following. Look for patterns. And what I mean by this is look for things that work. For example, if you discover a way to script and automate a database transfer from your on-prem server to the cloud, take notes. Um, tweak the process and use that on your next service. You'll learn the nuances between on-prem and cloud, um, and there are many of them. So keep notes. And as you migrate products or groups of applications or groups within the company, um, you want each one to be easier than the last, ideally. Which leads me right into this point, which is increase your automation. So now is the time to automate. So if you think about it, if you wanna automate software deployment, for example, um, if there's no pressing need, you're not gonna spend a lot of time on it. You're gonna say, hey, we should automate this deployment. And, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, we should totally do that. And then things get busy. Um, fires come up, engineer priorities shift, um, they start working on other things. This happens all the time. Um, however, if you need to manually move a piece of software from on-prem to the cloud, that's the perfect time right there to start automation. Um, start building an automated way to do that. So um, at that point, you're able to repeat the process. You have some automation there if you decide to say, crash the uh, virtual server, start it back up again. You wanna run a PowerShell script or a bash script, um, not go through a document or go through somebody's memory to get that thing deployed. So this is the point right here to really start automation and you can make it a part of your CI CD process after that. And it's also a good time to increase observability. Um, so that's another thing that gets put off by software teams. Um, having some observability, have profiling, security scans, things like that. Um, you know, why bother setting that up when we've got so much work to do is generally the answer. But the good news is that uh, whatever cloud provider you choose, they're going to have those services available. And you're more than welcome to use third-party services, of course, and other different services. But there are a set of services on each of the three cl cloud providers that you can use. So it's a good time to start plugging that in and install things and switch over to them. Um, and it's just one of those things you'll thank yourself for it later. Okay, so this is my favorite phrase to, favorite phase to be in, uh, repetition and expansion. So at this point, you're fully hybrid. You've got a mix of on-prem and in the cloud, um, including production applications, mission critical stuff. Um, you've got kind of a good mix on each. And you'll notice some renewed excitement from your innovation team at this point because you're going to see a lot of things working, a lot of things are going smoothly, and uh, you know people tend to get really excited about this. So I call this repetition and expansion because with every new project you're repeating the stuff that you've learned earlier, the stuff that worked in the past, and each project goes faster and faster because of that. And you and your innovation team start to look like rock stars at that point. Um, you've conducted experiments and taken notes. You've 
you're starting to establish some best practices in place. Um, naturally, you've set up some automation as part of your adoption in the cloud. Your CI and CD systems are starting to mature to a different point. Um, and you may even have like a clear path from committing to trunk to production at this point um, and having the changes pushed out automatically. So in this phase, leadership is fully committed to the cloud. There's no talk of going back. Um, they're only asking, you know, when is everything going to be into the cloud at that point? So you've got full buy-in from the groups. Um, your cost benefit analysis, hopefully at that point has shown that you're, that you're making the right move. Um, maybe you've had some incidents that have come up and the cloud services have come and, and saved the day and, and recovered everything. So this, uh, this phase is a really good phase to be in. This is just a lot of successes have happened and the expansion may stop, you know, um, at this point. You may move over most of your applications to the cloud, but have a few that stay behind. Um, many organizations stay in this phase for a very long time and that's okay. You know, you don't have to go 100% cloud if you don't need to. So if you're able to operate reliably, deliver features and fixes and things to customers fast, then there's no reason to, to stress out about a few applications that are still hosted on-prem. A few manual processes here and there are okay, and your results will vary. So to move out of this phase, <clears throat> out of phase three, you'll need to do the following. Make your delivery fully continuous. So deployment, integration, everything, from um, commit to production, is a perfectly smooth line. Um, when something's merged into main, it should pop up in production shortly after. Um, getting this locked down and solidified is very tough, um, very difficult, but it allows you to focus on other things. So there should be very little human intervention here. Um, these should be small changes. Your batch size should be reduced quite a bit to where it's single feature, um, single bug fix, things like that, and this allows everybody to kind of uh, free up and do what it is they want to do. You know, if they're a, a front end developer, um, they want to make cool, exciting interfaces. They don't want to be debugging their deployment. So the next part is um, documenting the migrations. Um, now there is a little bit of a kind of an aversion to documentation these days in software development. However, everything that's migrated should be documented somewhere. Um, just because you moved it to the cloud doesn't mean you'll never touch it again. Um, it's quite the opposite. So the more you document, the more you'll allow new engineers to understand what's going on as they're onboarded, and it makes your life easier if you decide to move that product to another cloud service. Um, because there, there's no rules saying that you need to stick with just one of the big three cloud services. Um, most of the time, you're going to find features on each of them that you really like, and you're going to be split up. Um, so if you decide to move those features, going back to that documentation six months ago that you've uh, kind of forgotten the process about, uh, it's very handy. And the last part is experiment over and over and over. Um, try new things. You know, well, moving to a new database server from a database server to a database service, make it run faster. Does it scale better? Is it cheaper? Um, you need to do constant experiments like this, like how, how low of a server provisioning can we go with and still operate smoothly to save costs? Or, um, you know, how can we change this architecture a little bit to improve scalability, speed, things like that? You know, once you're in the cloud, you've got a ton of different options you can go with. And so trying out each of those options and seeing how they work is super important. And it's very important to learn what doesn't work and document that as well. So let's say you're at phase four now. And at this point, it's observation and optimization. So very few organizations can really say that they're on the edge of every single one of these vectors I'm showing you here, but it's possible. So here you're in a cloud first environment. All of your applications live in the cloud. Um, any new application that you make is created in the cloud. All of your software is delivered through some form of continuous integration and deployment and it's done at a very rapid pace. So you're doing multiple deploys per day, maybe even multiple deploys per hour um, at this rate. And testing, I haven't talked a lot about testing yet, but in stage four, testing is automated and baked into the workflow. 
um, meaning you've got SDETs and testing engineers who have built automated systems so that when developers go and they run and they commit something into staging, it's automatically tested, it's automatically bulletproof and pushed out. Um, and then at that point, it just becomes an integration test um, from then on out. So leadership at this stage is fully invested in the cloud. So your job is to maintain and improve that investment by optimizing continuously and providing full visibility into operations. Um, visibility is super important. It gets put on the back burner a lot by many organizations um, due to price or like I said, being busy. Um, most people don't wanna set up observation software, um, things like profilers and security scans and things like that without a good reason. But as I said, it, it comes with the cloud. As you're moving into the cloud, there's many of those services available. And so it's good to take advantage of it. You know, it's good to find a slow piece of software somewhere and have it flag that. It's good to uh, experiment and see, you know, does this make things faster? Does this make things uh, a little more solid and reliable? So where do you go from here when you're in phase four? You know, you're fully cloud, that means you're done, right? And uh, not even close. <laughs> now your job is to keep the machine running successfully. So you must improve and focus um, on observability. Leave no stone unturned here. Um, every part of your process should be monitored and reported on, even if you rarely use it. You should be even timing how long uh, a git commit takes. Um, profilers, testing tools, chaos generators, all of these things should be a part of your everyday life now. And focus on building self-healing systems. So build systems that can recover from errors and fix themselves. And this is a pretty advanced area of the cloud, but it's very important. You wanna build failovers and um, even have systems that inject chaos into the infrastructure. So have a system that goes in and shuts down certain services, um, puts up blocks and then see how the system reacts to that. Um, and basically you wanna see how long it takes to repair. That's the MTTR, which is mean time to recovery. You wanna get that to be as low as possible. Um, you know, if a data, database connection fails, you want your software to come in and reroute things and move it and bring it back up again. And then finally focus on scaling. You know, what happens if you go viral overnight? What happens if you acquire another company and you need to move that traffic onto your infrastructure? Um, and at this point, you wanna focus on smart ways to scale up. So in conclusion, you wanna use the following factors to determine what your level of cloud maturity is. First part is hardware infrastructure. Does it live on site or in a data center, fully in the cloud or somewhere in between? And data, is your data on-prem with servers in the cloud or in between? So there's several different models here. You can have, um, you know, in a MS SQL server sitting on a, a big iron machine in a rack in your data center, or you can have any of the many data services, which are basically you connect to them with an API. Um, and then there's a lot of points in between there. An application, are they hosted applications like on a traditional web server? Are they um, actually old like service oriented architecture type applications? Are they hosted in a cloud service? Are they a series of lambdas? Um, this is kind of the spectrum you wanna focus on for applications. And virtualization, um, are you using conventional bare metal machines? Are you using a big bare metal machine with a bunch of virtual servers in it? Or virtual servers hosted in the cloud? Or at some point you won't have virtual servers at all, um, depending on your design. So your deployment and integration is another vector. You know, is it fully manual, fully automated, or is it some kind of uh, mix? And finally, executive buy-in. So is management reviewing proposals? Are they giving you the green light? Um, are they looking at it kind of leery, like why are we doing this? Um, show me more, or are they 100% vested? And, and that's all going to depend on where you're at on that matrix. So here are the main takeaways that I've touched on. And these are the things that you'll need to do in order to be successful in any cloud transformation. Experiment. Try new things, see what happens. Like when you convert a service or a new way to automate something, see if it works and clearly define it 
use the scientific process whenever possible and just experiment as much as you can experiment. You know, what would happen if we did this? What would happen if we do that? It's very important. And the amount of experiments you do and the amount of time it takes to do these experiments should be getting smaller each time. And the next point is fail often and learn. So if everything you do is succeeding the first time you try it, you're probably not innovating fast enough, you're not pushing yourself fast enough, and your competition will. So take risks and be willing to fail and then try to learn from it. So blameless postmortems are one of the best ways I can see to encourage this. Um, when something breaks, get together, have the postmortem, um, but don't do finger pointing and, and you know, this is all this person's fault or that person's fault. Um, but just have blameless postmortems where, you know, we have failed. Here's why we think it failed. Here's what we learned from it. Here's what we're going to do differently. And finally, create a culture of learning. And what I mean by that is encourage your team to fail and experiment. So experiment and fail often. When they fail, don't chastise them or threaten to fire them. You know, if someone has a personal failure, um, encourage them to learn from mistakes and move forward. So encourage them to experiment. Any member of your team can contribute greatness. It can be the architect with 30 years of experience, or it can be an intern with a great idea. Give everybody a voice, give everyone a chance, and encourage this kind of experimentation and moving forward. Um, listen and consider everyone and make them feel like it's safe to contribute. And thank you so much for attending this webinar. Um, I love the fact that people are as excited about things like cloud migrations and integrations and things as I am. So um, go out and conquer this. Um, I will be taking some questions from the audience now. So feel free to, to reach out and start asking questions. Okay. And the First question I have here, would it be a good idea to move the application step-by-step step into the cloud? For example, move all user uploaded files into the cloud first, then move the rest of the software at another point. Does your experience show any problems with this approach? Um, this one, it kind of depends on the type of application, but um, I have seen it in my experience, I have seen it work. Um, many times. So user uploaded files is actually um, a really good place to start just using that example because if you can get a faster on-demand file service to put those files on and you can securely connect your application on-prem to do so, um, that's an excellent start. You know, it's kind of moving um, the low dependency things there. So um, I don't see any problems with that approach right offhand um, other than, you know, some crazy unknowns that might factor in. But yes, if you can split the, the application rather than moving the whole application as a chunk, if you can split up parts of it atomically and do that and make it work, that is a, a great way to kind of ease into it. And another question here is the maturity model vector diagram going to be made available? Um, Yes, it is, and I will try to get some more information about that. Um, is the information you present available in written form, like a book or white paper? Um, I have written some articles on the Pluralsight blog that touch on a lot of this. So if you go to our Pluralsight blog, um, there's been quite a bit that uh, myself and other authors have put out over the last few months that um, kind of puts all this together. And our next question, any insights on operations with cloud, for example, SREs, any ideas for smooth handling of operations? So SREs um, is kind of a new, kind of a new role. I mean, it's, it's not really that new, I guess it's probably, they've probably been around for about 10 years or so. Um, but some of my ideas for smooth handling of operations um, and that specifically relates to SREs, are focusing on the process. Uh, many times people focus a little too hard on the technology. Um, and one of the things that, that I would do in consulting 
and as an engineer is always ask, what problem are you trying to solve? That's the very first question um, that you should ask any of the executives, stakeholders, and even other engineers is what problem are you trying to solve? Um, because many times the cloud doesn't provide that solution right away or more technology, you know, just throwing technology at it doesn't always solve the problem either. Um, so that's for smooth handling of operations. The very first step is ask what problem are you trying to solve? And the next part of that would be focusing on process itself. So um, without harping on DevOps too much, um, the process itself is very important to smooth handling of operations. Um, it's, it's even more important than the technology many times is how are you doing things? Are you releasing things in giant batches um, or are they small batches? Uh, do you have failover, resiliency, things like that? Um, a lot of that's based in the process. And my next question, how do I become a cloud solution architect? Um, so that if you've determined that as a goal, one of the best ways that I think you should do it is um, to go online, um, get training in basically like you're probably going to choose a, an operating system to start to focus on, even though there are mixed Windows and Linux hybrids. For the most part, it's going to be one or the other still. Um, focus on as much operating system knowledge as you can gather. Um, and that's the same with networking, things like that. And my suggestion would be to find tutorials, um, find plural site courses, things like that, and then build your own project. These days you can get a used PC, the big old box PCs, um, you can get a used PC for relatively cheap. You can install VMware on it. You can install VirtualBox, something like that. You can create your own networks to really get the idea of how networking works. And then you can go to the cloud and apply that same knowledge to the cloud. And there, there of course, are tons of nuances. However, um, if you know how to spin up a bunch of servers, virtual servers, and wire them together on this little box in your room, you'll be able to go to the cloud and it will make a lot more sense. And uh, here's a great question. Have you ever had experience where migration did not work and you had to revert back to on-prem? Um, several times I have seen that in place. And a lot of it has to do with, um, so one time I've seen things rolled back to on-prem for what I, in my opinion, consider to be the wrong reasons. And it was security. So there was an idea that things are less secure in the cloud than they were in our data center where our people were looking at them. And um, I don't personally don't find that to be true most of the time. I think you can put an insecure system anywhere for one. You can have an insecure system in a on-prem or in the cloud. If it's insecure, it's insecure. Also, I think that um, people tend to forget that cloud services, if, if you're insecure on a cloud service, they are insecure as well. So um, companies like Microsoft, Google, and Amazon put quite a bit of effort into security, securing those systems because they're securing their systems as well. If you're hosting a VM on their network, um, then they're opening themselves up as, as well. So, you know, you're trusting of a security team of these big companies with some of the smartest engineers in the world. Um, so I feel that uh, keeping your stuff on prem due to security is a mistake. And that's where I've seen a lot of times. And then other times I've just seen it through basic compatibility issues. Okay, and here's another question. Most likely progress is in different areas, vectors will happen at a different time. What are the problems progressing quickly in one area, but not the others? For example, more quickly in data than applications? What are the dependencies between the various vectors during the journey to more maturity? Um, so some of, the, some of the vectors are tied pretty close together. The ones you mentioned there, applications and data are, are definitely coupled together. So if you move faster in one area than the other, you might be creating more work for yourself. However, that might be the situation that you're in. You may have no other choice. Um, but as far as tight coupling, Applications and data are superly, super tight coupling there. Um, so the best thing that you can do is 
is try to make compromise in some areas. So, you know, before we move to this next phase with our database and move to a data service, uh, we are going to need to do this with the application to make it easier. And sometimes what that requires is just sitting down and looking at the big picture, zooming in, and then experimenting a bunch to figure it out. Um, some of the other vectors like continuous integration, continuous deployment, those ones are coupled to nearly every other vector on there. So those ones are going to be probably the most difficult to uh, move through for that reason. Uh, please tell everyone what SRE stands for, Site Reliability Engineer. Uh, that was a role that was uh, first created by Google. Um, they started calling people Site Reliability Engineers, and then everyone else kind of picked that up and ran with it. So a Site Reliability Engineer is um, essentially, so one of the things that, uh, one of my pet peeves was people calling uh, folks DevOps technicians or DevOps, and I've had, personally have had that job title myself. I was an intermediate DevOps engineer was my first uh, DevOps job. And uh, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense when you understand DevOps to assign DevOps to a role, but site reliability engineer um, is quite a bit clearer. You know, your job is to keep things reliable, keep fail safes up, keep everything running. Um, so I like, personally, I like site reliability engineer a lot better than uh, DevOps engineer. Our next question, how do we address the limited unreliable infrastructure in developing countries in relation to the cloud? And that is a, a very good question. And that's, that's one of the points where I said, sometimes you don't wanna go 100% in the cloud and being on-prem is okay. That is definitely one of those times because you know these cloud providers are trying to go out into every country in the world and every space in the world. And they're doing a, a fairly good job of it considering how large the world is. However, if you are in an area where the cloud providers are kind of shaky and things aren't being transferred to other endpoints the way you'd like, um, then that is a place where you'd probably want to stay on-prem for a little while or, um, you know, find a different approach to doing it. And in terms of migration to cloud, how do we cater to single cloud versus hybrid cloud migration approach and the complexities around it? Um, so for that, that kind of depends, uh, once again, what problem are you trying to solve is the first, the first question I would ask for that. Um, you know, is there a reason that you're going with a hybrid cloud migration? What are those reasonings? Are you planning on staying there? Are you planning on moving forward? Um, and if I'm assuming what you mean by single cloud is single provider, um, is that single provider basically meeting all of your needs? And if so, then there, there really isn't any reason to change it. However, if I would say 75% of those need, needs are being met by another cloud provider and you want to go single cloud at about 75% is where I would move things to that, that other provider. And I do see another question here that I think is a good question, even though I don't have the answer to it, I will find the answer. If you have moved all of your on-prem apps and workloads to cloud and all you have left is AD on-prem, do you recommend any good information videos to move AD to the cloud and totally get rid of on-prem? Um, so with that, I know for a fact that Pluralsight does have some courses on Active Directory in the cloud as far as uh, Azure Active Directory, but I'm not sure of all of the individual ones, but there, um, there definitely are some good uh, resources for training for doing that because generally um, that is a really good point. AD is usually left on-prem till the last minute um, for obvious reasons. AD is extremely complex. You've already got an internal network with people sitting in their cubicles that are connecting through AD and connecting to their system. So picking up that entire system and moving it out to the cloud is usually extremely complex and difficult. So um, that is one of the last ones usually that, that hold out. 
And here's a question. Are there any tools that will give a single view of all resources in a multi-cloud environment? None that I'm aware of. Um, now, I do have some friends that uh, are doing a lot of AWS and Azure stuff at the same time, and they've done a lot of work with APIs. So they've built their own custom kind of system to interact with the, uh, with the APIs, but I don't know of any off the top of my head that I could just say, yes, this one looks at uh, different providers. And what is single cloud versus hybrid cloud? So through most definitions, single cloud is, um, you know, we are only on Azure. Um, everything that we have is on Azure, on AWS, on GCP. Um, and then hybrid cloud is we've got a little bit of stuff on AWS, a little stuff on Azure. Um, I've seen that sort of hybrid cloud thing quite a bit. Um, so I've seen a lot of people that use Azure for applications because they're using .NET applications but they really like S3 on Amazon for file services. So that, that coupling I've seen quite a bit where their .NET applications are on Azure, ton of stuff running on Azure, um, and then they're using AWS for file services. Um, so that's kind of single cloud versus hybrid cloud. I think my definition would be um, mostly based on the services. And here's another good question. Does going to the cloud automatically mean you take microservices approach while coming from monolith apps? Um, I guess a typical attorney answer would be it depends. However, um, I don't think that every single architecture out there should be a microservice. Um, and I know I'm not alone with that opinion. So it, it doesn't automatically mean that you have to take a microservices approach when you're moving to the cloud, because that's one of the reasons that they provide uh, virtual private servers is, say you have a, a monolithic application that's running on, say it's running .NET on an IAS server, and uh, it's a bare metal server, you wanna move that to the cloud, you don't wanna take that and break it up into a bunch of microservices and, and things like that you can pick it up and take it to a virtual server in the cloud. And then you're enjoying some of the things in the cloud like scalability, security, availability, reliability, all of those things. And essentially you've taken your big server and you've just pushed it up onto the cloud. That's very common and that's why those services are out there. And of course, a lot of um, folks in tech will push you towards not having that big virtual server and breaking things into microservices and little services. But if um, if your monolithic application is serving and doing its job well, then you have to look at whether or not you want to put that kind of effort into it. You know, if, if the monolithic app is doing everything you want it to do, it's running well, it's running great, um, it's available, I don't think you should uh, push it to microservices just because microservices is a thing, and I don't think that you have to automatically to answer the question. What is the difference between community cloud and public cloud and VPC? So I'm not exactly sure what community cloud is. That may be, um, I mean, public cloud I know is publicly available things. You can have a, what's called a private cloud. And so that's kind of an interesting concept. It's a mix of on-prem on and cloud where um, you take devices from Amazon or from Microsoft, and I assume Google has something similar, but you can uh, take machines and put them in your data center, and those machines come from Amazon or um, Microsoft, and what they have is they have a cloud infrastructure that's built into your private network, so you're behind a firewall, um, you're still on your internal network, but you have some of the scaling capabilities and things like that um, for high availability high availability applications, especially like uh, file services. And so I'm assuming that I'm reading that correctly. And then VPC is a uh, virtual private, um, or no, I, I'm not sure what, the, what that one is. I was thinking virtual private servers, but so yeah, I'm not sure about that one. So I think that's, about it for questions. Okay, 
Great, Jeremy, I was just making sure that you uh, got a chance to, to look at all those. Um, thank you everyone who joined us today. And we had a few questions about uh, accessing a recording of today's presentation. Um, if you've joined us via Zoom, you will receive a link or an email with a link to the recording and also uh, Jeremy's slides probably later today or tomorrow. Um, if you've joined us on another platform, wherever you're joining us, you can access that uh, the recorded version of the presentation uh, immediately. So hopefully that works. Um, Jeremy, I wanted to give you the opportunity to maybe leave one final takeaway with everyone here um, and maybe uh, provide some instructions if anyone wants to contact you directly after today's uh, presentation. Sure. Um, so I, I kind of gave my final thoughts, and I think one of the most important ones is creating a culture of learning. Um, so that is one of the things that um, sometimes is overlooked or people don't think about it as much, but uh, just creating a culture where people feel safe to experiment and do crazy things and um, allow the people on your teams to really experiment and go crazy. Um, if you'd like to get a hold of me, I'm on Twitter at Jeremy C. Morgan, um, LinkedIn, and I get uh, emails and private messages all the time asking things, and I enjoy it. So um, if anyone wants to reach out in private that they didn't feel like asking something publicly, um, feel free to reach out, and uh, I'll be available. Great. And I know, you know, there were a lot of questions. There were some that we just unfortunately didn't have time to get to today. So like Jeremy said, please hit him up. Uh, I, if he's always on Twitter, Jeremy C. Morgan, like he said. So uh, message him there and I'm sure he's happy to chat about some of your questions if he wasn't able to get to them today. But uh, with that, thanks again to everyone who joined us and you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.